Hey, everybody. I'm live. I'm going to be reading from my brand new book, Drive All Day. Here it is. And um, I'm going to talk about my other books. And I thought I would open with a song. So if you all want to chat with me during this live broadcast, please do. Um, I just want to make it clear for those of you who are here for my lessons. This is not a lesson. I'm just reading from my book and uh, doing a song. Um, sometime later in the year, I'll do some live lessons. But right now, that's not what I'm doing. So hope you all are doing great on this fine uh, Sunday afternoon. At least it's Sunday afternoon here in Ottawa, Canada. And I'd love it if you could tune in and tell me where you are at. So I'm going to open with one of my original songs and then we'll get right to the books. So this is a song that I wrote for a friend of mine. Another long distance call on my dime. Relationships, nothing but a long, hard climb. I'm talking on a payphone because I don't have a cell. You say you're out of message, I'm out of time as well. Out of minutes, out of hours, out of days, out of time. The way we wasted love, especially mine. Out of lust, out of patience, out of sanity, your love cost me big. Breaking up was free. We tried to be friends, but you left me alone. When I had that accident, you didn't even fall. At first, I was surprised that it hit me like a brick. Once again, I'm left listening to that old clock tick. Out of minutes, out of hours, out of days, out of time. The way we wasted love, especially mine. Out of lust, out of patience, out of sanity. Your love cost me big. Breaking up was free. Gonna move to a minor key, but I won't stay. Gonna take some time for me to send you this song. Maybe not, cause I'm out of it inside of hours, out of days, out of time. The way we waste love, especially mine. Out of lust, out of patience, out of sanity, your love cost me big. Breaking up was free. Breaking up was free. Breaking up was, I can't hear you, you're breaking up. Breaking up was free. <laughs> there we go. That's uh, my original song called Out of Time. And oh, good, Sandra's here. It's nice to see you. I always look forward to your comments. Uh, feel free to comment as I'm going through uh, reading my new book. And um, there is someone else here. Oh, but I'm not seeing the name. That's all right. You don't have to identify yourself. So I uh, I published my first book in 2013, Drive All Night, and it's a memoir. I've been touring for over 30 years, and this is some stories from the road. Some crazy ones like the time I shared housing with a pig a real one, uh, the time I did a show, and uh, Melissa Etheridge came to the show. I was a little nervous. <laughs> My next book was An Army of Lovers, and um, that is about women's music of the 70s and the 80s. I did over 100 interviews. I spent about eight years doing research and writing this book, and it covers uh, artists like Holly Nair and Sweet Honey in the Rock and events like the National Women's Music Festival. And um, that one came out in 2019. And I'm going to be reading from my brand new book, Drive All Day, because I'm too old to drive all night. <laughs> and some more stories from the road and a few chapters about my students and anything music related that I felt like writing about. And as usual, there's a lot of humor. And that's what I do. But also I have some serious kinds of things that I write about too. And uh, oh, good. Larry's here. Hi, Larry. And uh, a classic music. 
uh, Khadija. I'm sorry if I'm um, mispronouncing your name. Khadija likes my t-shirt. It says peace in three languages. Uh, you can see on the bottom, it says peace in English for those of you who don't read the other two languages. And oh, from Spain, welcome, welcome. And um, Army of Lovers. Hi from Tucson, from Mary. Hi, Mary. And Sam's here from Cambodia. Oh, that's awesome. Cambodia, Cambodia. that must be like the middle of the night there. Um, anyway, I am Jamie Anderson, and I'm going to be reading from uh, Drive All Day, my brand new book, which just came out. I'm very excited about that. So I'm going to read to you the introduction. When my first publisher called to say they wanted to publish my book, Drive All Night, I was ecstatic. She said that one of the things they liked about my first memoir was that I wrote like people knew who I was. Well, of course. Who wants to read a book about someone who's apologetic? Musicians have to have an ego. No one hears no more at their jobs, especially if they book their own gigs, something I've always done in 30 plus years of touring. Rejection happens for many reasons and not always because you stink or you slept with your girlfriend. We get a gig because we keep bugging uh, or contacting the venue until we get a positive answer. And to do that, you have to believe you're as good as Adele or at least her neighbor's dentist. No only means I go on to the next contact. It's my second favorite answer. It's not enough that I play music. I decided to write books too. And again, no is heard a lot more than yes. John Grisham's first book, A Time to Kill, was rejected 20 some times. He went on to sell millions of books, including The Firm, which was made into a movie. I mention this because, fun fact, a poster from one of my albums appears in the office of the main character. Sorry, I got off track. I started bragging and lost my way like the last time I tried to find my car at the airport at 3 a.m. So after my first memoir, a collection of stories from the road, I thought I'd write another one because ego. <laughs> And I had a lot more to say. Since the first book was called Drive All Night, I thought an apt title for this one would be Drive All Day because I'm too old to drive all night. I no longer can drive for eight hours, hop on stage, and remember all the words to my songs. I no longer sleep on lumpy sofa beds and eat fast food that's cut 10 years from my life. But I can still find a Starbucks in any state or province without a map. I've changed a few of the names and details to protect the near innocent, but if I use someone's full name, it's their real name. I haven't changed any of the major details because really, who can make this stuff up? If you work for Spotify, don't bother suing me because unless you take the four boxes of LPs from my basement as payment, I plan to be buried with my guitars, the only thing of value I own, so neener, neener. I mentioned Spotify uh, because I have a whole chapter about them. Um, Spotify is not very kind to musicians. I mean, unless you're Lady Gaga or Beyonce, you don't really make much money from Spotify. Uh, one quarter I had it was a little over 200 unique listens and they paid me the princely sum of 10 cents. Yeah. Anyway, I go on to say, don't be horrified at the gigs I do in the crowded places I visit where no one is wearing a mask. That's because much of this was written before the pandemic. Thanks to everyone who's come to my shows, read my books, and taken my lessons. If it weren't for your support, I'd be sitting in my living room singing for my cats, and they don't clap. In fact, they pin their ears back and run out of the room. I'll keep writing whether or not you know who I am. Maybe you will eventually. Maybe my cats will learn to appreciate me. Both would be great. So that's the intro for Drive All Day, and I noticed a few more of you have tuned in and... Uh, Oh, classic music is here from Finland. Oh my gosh, it must be the middle of the night there. Um, Sam uh, loves my channel. Well, thank you, Sam. I'm glad that that you tune in. And there's Sandra and Sam again. Uh, can I know how to be good at guitar like you? Well, it's all about the practice. So, you know, tune into my channel and practice. There you go. I know. I wish there was a magic pill. If there was, we'd all be Bonnie Raitt, you know. Anyway, so here's more from my book. If you want to know how uh, to purchase my book, it's at Amazon and all the usual places. I posted a link to Book Baby, uh, which is a really good place to buy it. Here's another chapter from the book. This one's called A Scofflaw and Her Kittens. Some years ago, a friend sent me irises. She grows rare and antique varieties, and I thought, and she thought I'd enjoy them. They went into my yard in Durham, North Carolina. 
After a year, they bloomed in rich purple, delicate pink, and creamy white. When I went through a divorce and lost the house, I didn't want to leave those lovely flowers, so I dug up several and I put them in pots. My new apartment had a rooftop patio. They did fairly well there, although there weren't many blooms. A year later, I was able to buy my own house. The irises came with me. They thrived in my garden. Five years later, I moved again, this time to Canada. I hated to leave the flowers, but it was against the law to transport live plants across the border. Every year when I visited Durham, I'd stock my old house, noting that the irises were still doing well. I missed them, so I did something that made me shake in my boots. I talked with the present owner and asked if I could take a few lessons, a few irises, thoughtfully pointing out that they needed to be thinned anyway. He said yes, and thus the shaking began because I'd have to sneak them over the border. I'm even a little nervous writing that. Is there a statute of limitations for plant smuggling? With the irises in a plastic grocery bag and stuffed in the back of my car, I nonchalantly told the border official, I didn't buy anything in the U.S. except for that bag of M&M sitting on the seat beside me. Here's where being a white woman with gray hair comes in handy. He didn't notice the sweat pooling under my armpits and simply nodded and waved me through. Not long ago, I told the Canadian who filmed some videos for me that I had done this. He laughed. He said he crossed the border a lot and they always searched his van. A young guy with a van full of video equipment is always going to be suspect. He nodded sagely when I told him it'd be worse if he was black. When I got home, I was afraid to plant them in the yard. With winter temps below freezing for days in a row, I didn't think these delicate flowers would make it. So I planted them in pots, bringing them inside during the coldest months. Their leaves never got very green and the plants grew little. One tiny pale pink flower emerged the next year, but that was it. There was a sunny spot in our yard where my elderly cat liked to lay. When I had her put to sleep, I thought that was the perfect spot to put her ashes. I added the ashes of two other cats I'd carried around for several years. They needed something beautiful in that spot, so I decided to take a chance and put the irises there. I'd seen neighbors with irises in their yard, so maybe they do okay with the harsh wither after all. I carefully watered them, but there were no blooms that year. The next year in late May, I left on my annual trip to North Carolina. One week after that, I got an email and a photo from my wife. Look at this, she wrote, and under the note was a photo of that spot with a burst of pale pink flowers. I'd lost touch with a friend who had given me the irises years before. I tracked her down on Facebook. I told her about the blooms and included the photo. Oh, she responded. Those are called pink kittens. Despite having other colors in that original batch she'd sent, only the pink ones bloomed. Every year in early June, they bloom. It hurt my heart when we sold the house, a place I lived for 10 years. I left my cat's ashes there. The pink kittens will watch over them. So, oh, more of you have tuned in. Hey, Bim, it's good to see you here. Now, that chapter doesn't have a whole lot to do with music, but a lot of my other chapters do. I talk about some of my gigs and about my students. Um, this is about one of my gigs. The title of the chapter is Hallelujah. Sam says, it's a, it's a great time for me that I can chat with you through this live chat. Yeah, it is pretty cool, Sam. Um, I, uh, I used to do live lessons on YouTube. I, I haven't done that in a year or so. Maybe I'll, I'll pick that up again. So, you know, stay, stay with me on my channel and uh, I can set it up. It used to be that I did uh, the live chats on another device and I couldn't see your comments as they came in, but I've got a new laptop. And so I can see your comments. It's kind of cool. Um, anyway, so here's a chapter called Hallelujah. When I first got the day hospice gig, I envisioned beds filled with weak looking people surrounded by solemn loved ones, my soothing music helping them rest. Turned out they'd rather hear eight days a week or wagon wheel. I played in a comfortable living room, not a bed in sight. There was usually a raucous card game going on as a volunteer pushed a cart with snacks and juice served in elegant wine glasses. 
I always looked for Andrew when I arrived for my shift. When I first met him a year ago, a middle-aged white guy in casual clothes, brown hair carefully combed to the side, he was thin and moving slowly. Even though he kidded me about the ukulele, he sometimes looked my way and smiled when I did a song he liked. Turned out he just liked to hassle me since he played a superior instrument, the guitar. After being away for the summer, I came into the living room. I moved a chair, unfolded the music stand, and pulled the ukulele out of the case. While I tuned, I looked around for Andrew. When I didn't see him, my first thought was, did he pass? I always wondered when I saw someone one week and not the next. It could simply be that they recovered or went to another hospice. However, it could be the inevitable. Fifteen minutes passed before Andrew strolled into the room with an energetic step. He looked better than that first time, his color robust, so my thoughts switched to something more positive. Maybe he was recovering. I didn't know anything about Andrew's health. We weren't allowed to ask why the clients were there unless they brought it up. We only provided art projects, card games, food, massage, and music. I was usually background music to a decibel busting card game. Someone played a good hand and they all screamed with laughter and then pointed fingers at Andrew, accusing him of having cards up his sleeve. I didn't care that they found Euchre more interesting than my music. They were there to enjoy themselves and perhaps forget about pain and hospitals and what their last test revealed. Once in a while, I saw a foot tapping or lips moving to the lyrics. Sometimes they clipped af clapped after I finished a song. Usually they didn't. They didn't know if I, I, that I toured over 30 years or that I recorded 13 albums. It didn't matter. Andrew told me he liked Creedence Clearwater or Revival, so one week I brought in songs for him. Partway through Bad Moon Rising, I realized it was one of those songs where you really don't hear the lyrics until you sing them. There I was cheerfully singing about rage and ruin at the end of the world when I decided that one verse and a chorus was enough. I switched to Down on the Corner. An upbeat song about buskers was much better. One week I brought the guitar. Andrew grinned and commented, you brought the big boy. Big girl, I corrected, and we all laughed. I'm good at faces, bad at names. I remember Andrew because he was there every time. He doesn't always recall my name, and sometimes he looks confused when I bring up his guitar playing, like he can't fathom how I know he plays. Some weeks we've had conversations about kinds of music and guitars, but his meds probably scramble his brain. As long as he enjoys our talks in the moment, it's good. One day, Andrew was in the parking lot smoking a cigarette when I walked up for my gig. Oh, good, it's you, he said between puffs. When it's not you, that lady with the harp shows up, and I'm not ready for that yet. One day, an elderly gentleman slowly lowered himself into a recliner near me. A volunteer covered his lap with a blanket. He confided that he couldn't sing or remember the words to anything. I assured him that it didn't matter. When I got to the chorus of Brown Eyed Girl, I invited him to sing along. He softly sang in a creaky voice. La, 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 ti da. See, you can remember the words I complimented him. A smile lit up his face. A young woman in her 30s was often there. She wore a turban and sat next to an oxygen tank. As I was packing up one day, she smiled and commented that she, likes those, she liked those old songs. Old songs? Did she not hear me play Riptide? Okay, one song out of 30 written after 1980 did not count. I had to give my musician's ego a firm down girl. I was strumming a rhythmic song one day and looked up to see a thin woman half her jaw missing, but still smiling and bouncing up and down. I love that song, she exclaimed after I was done, telling me how much she loved that band. Do you know anything else by them? I didn't, but she was happy to boogie along to the next song I did. I only saw her that one time. The volunteers, mostly older women, were sweet. They sat near clients, talking or simply sitting in silence. One gave hand massages. One, in her 80s, was usually dressed in pastels, her white hair carefully curled. She clapped to my faster songs, usually offbeat. She sang, even when she didn't know the words. The clients were fairly mobile, some using a wheelchair or walker, and only there for the day. We got them out of their house, gave their caretakers a break, 
and offered social time and something to do. One day, one of the volunteers leaned down between songs and quietly said to me, a client passed in one of the back rooms. He'll be wheeled down the hallway, and when that happens, there's a moment of silence. A few minutes later, she said softly, it's time. I'd been singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. I stopped, the last chord gently fading away. We all turned toward the hall as a group of people, heads bowed, pushed a covered gurney slowly by. A minute later, the boisterous card game resumed and I finished Hallelujah, Fighting Tears. So that's from Drive All Day and uh, that chapter is called Hallelujah. Unfortunately, the, uh, the hospice shut down during the pandemic and uh, it hasn't started up again. So I, I don't know if it will, but um, it was really uh, a satisfying volunteer gig. I enjoyed meeting all those people and playing music for them. So looks like there's a few. Oh, thank you, Larry. Uh, yeah, it's called Drive All Day. Here's what it looks like. And you can get it at Amazon and Book Baby and lots of other places. After I'm done with this broadcast, I'll type some links in for you so that you can find it a little easier. Oh, you're welcome, Sam. I'm happy to help you improve your English. I know how hard it is to learn another language. I've been trying to learn French for about 10 years now. <laughs> I haven't been very successful. Oh, hi, Joe. Is it Joe Lou or just Joe? Hi from Austria. Holy cow. All these people tuning in from overseas. Y'all must have set your alarm and gotten up in the middle of the night. I really appreciate you tuning in. It, it means a lot to me. So uh, so I am reading for my new book, uh, Drive All Day, and uh, it's a collection of stories from the road, stories about my students, and uh, stories about gigs, uh, like the last one that I read. Um, a lot of you are here because you take my lessons at YouTube, so I thought I'd read a chapter about my students. This one is called, We Couldn't Find Her Guitar and Other Excuses. Oh, the sad life of a music teacher. We labor long hours for you and your children only to find out that some of you aren't practicing. If I ever decide to become a priest, I could say I've got lots of experience hearing confessions. At least the excuses are entertaining. We couldn't find her guitar. They found it a few days later and it was in their van. I think it had a few Cheerios stuck to it and a corner where the dog had shooed it or a rat. If they can lose a whole guitar, I shudder to think what else they've mislaid. Doctor, we couldn't come in for a checkup. We've misplaced the baby. The dog ate my music. I saw the book after the pooch had done his dirty deed, and indeed it looked pretty bad. I shouldn't have told anyone about this because I'm sure some of my students smeared pastrami all over their Mel Bay book. Ask any guitar player about Mel Bay. He's the guy responsible for every instruction book ever made. It just feels like that. <laughs> the reason that many of us are forced to learn Yankee Doodle. I had a touch of leprosy. <laughs> My friend Gwen was kidding when she suggested this one, but I have heard some pretty creative illness and injury types of excuses. Sure, if you're flat on your back with the flu, I don't expect you to practice. However, a hurt finger that looks fine and seems to work well is not an excuse. The fiddle player in my band once broke her sternum. Now that's a valid excuse. I forgot. Try to be more creative than that. Include a house fire, amputation, or a dying hamster. We teachers like to be entertained. The guitar is at my dad's, mom's, cousin's, the summer cottage, the other car, the bottom of a well. <laughs> well, go get it. <laughs> From a nine-year-old, I didn't have time. When I suggested he cut out a few hours of Super Mario and practice instead, he recoiled in horror. For kids, I have them recount how much time they need for daily activities from breakfast to doing home homework. We add up the time and usually there's at least three hours free, even if their math teacher assigns extra schoolwork for that week. Adults who regularly give me that excuse 
are a lost cause. If they think that showing up for once a week lesson is going to make them Eric clapped and there's nothing I can do except tactfully point out after a few months that they aren't Clapton or even his fifth cousin twice removed. It was out of tune. Well, clearly that's a type topic we need to cover in lessons. A string broke. Squeeze $2 out of your budget, buy a new string, and I'll show you how to replace it. Meanwhile, make do with five strings. Banjo players do it all the time. It hurts my fingers. Well, of course it does. Pressing tender fingertips into a metal wire is not a pleasant experience. If there was no pain involved, we'd all be Joan Jett. And by the way, your fingers wouldn't hurt so much if you <clears throat> practiced. I don't want to play that. I'll admit the Claire de Lune is not the most exciting piece on the planet, but you can't start right out on Purple Haze. Trust me on this one. I'll bet even Hendrix started with Claire de Lune, albeit with distortion and cranked to 11 and a half, and then he set his guitar on fire afterwards. I lost my music. <sighs> lose your mind, lose your way, or lose your cookies. Try not to lose your music. If they do, they have these things called stores and the internet. I thought my lesson was tomorrow, so you only practice the night before a lesson? You told me to put the music inside my binder. You didn't say I could take it out. My friend Brandy used this one on a high school teacher. When all else fails, make the teacher laugh. So there are some of the very creative uh, excuses that I get from my students. And uh, I've, heard, I've heard them all, believe me. So who else is tuned in? Hi, Wilbert. Um, you're from Hanover? Is that what you were starting to type? I'm not sure what what country is that, because I, I have um, I have followers from all over the world, which is very cool. Um, thank you, Joe. And uh, Sam has to go. Well, don't worry, Sam. I will be saving uh, this as a, uh, um, a recording, and it'll be on my YouTube page. I'll post it on Facebook too, in case you're a Facebook friend. And uh, 1.24 a.m. in Cambodia. Well, that's, I'm just flattered that you tuned in for as much as uh, the, the reading as you did. So in case you missed me saying, and I am reading from my book, Drive All Day, and it's available for Amazon and all sorts of places. I'll also post some links after this is all done so that you can uh, find it easier. Um, I write a lot about my students because they're so entertaining. And uh, I want to encourage other people to play instruments, um, although I, I think I encourage you in this book. <laughs> um, um, I have a kind of a long uh, chapter called Women Don't Teach Guitar, right? And I'm just going to read you part of that one. Um, I started off by talking about Googling guitar teacher in Google Images, and I came up with a whole bunch of images of mostly young white guys leaning in close with a guitar next to a child or a woman. Apparently women do not teach guitar. I mean, that's what I learned. Or people of color, apparently. Uh, so, um, and, I, and I did that search for the first time a few years ago. And I did it again when I wrote the book this year. Same thing. There's not a whole lot of women they show teaching guitar. They didn't call me. Um, I talk about a lot of my favorite students and some of my not so favorite students. <laughs> um, and uh, in one section, I talk about musical family. Sometimes I have more than one member of a family take lessons from you, from me. And so uh, here's a, a little bit about that. Guy and Nyla were another musical family. Guy, a sweet, sweet man in his early 40s, took lessons from me first. He was the opposite of a mansplainer, never acting like he had to prove anything to me. After he stopped lessons, his daughter Nyla started. An outgoing 10-year-old, she had her dad's sweet demeanor. Her long curly hair was usually piled on top of her head in a sloppy bun. She wore comfortable clothing and laughed easily. I taught her lots of songs, including Let It Go, a song by James Bay. We often joked about that other song, Let It Go, from the movie Frozen. She kidded that she was going to sing that one for me at the next lesson. I told her she'd have to wear a princess outfit. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Frozen. It stars Princess who sings that song. And anybody with a, a kid is probably tired of that song. Anybody, at least in North America. 
I go on. I taught Nyla to read music. The spiritual, oh, Mary, don't you weep, had a lot of syncopation, so it required extra effort. After working on it for several weeks, she shook her head and informed me, this song is making me weep. It took us several minutes to stop laughing and get down to the lesson. After a few weeks, she finally mastered the song and somberly informed me, no more weeping. She loved Taylor Swift, so I learned several of her songs to teach to Nyla. Before that, I didn't have a high opinion of the artist, thinking that she only wrote whiny songs about exes, but these songs turned me around. Swift wrote accessible lyrics and an engaging narrative. I also love that she played guitar. Girls have so few female role models in music, especially women who have control over their careers. Uh, Nyla is still a student of mine and at a recent lesson, uh, she's been working on an original song and I complimented her on the song and I joked, uh, when you win your Grammys and Junos, don't forget to thank me. And she said, oh, I'll thank you, my dad and Taylor Swift. <laughs> So I said, well, I'm glad you're going to thank me first. That means a lot to me. Uh, I also talk about um, uh, students that I got from the Chinese embassy. Uh, the embassy sent me over three different students, and they're all wonderful kids. They were not real familiar with Western culture because they'd you know, grown up in China. And so I, I had interesting questions about like Beatles songs. You know, one kid wanted to know if Eleanor Rigby was a real person. Um, she also wanted to know what House of the Rising Sun was about. And um, that's a hard one to explain to a 10 year old Chinese girl. You know, um, I thought, well, how deep do I go into this? Because really the original view version is about a house of prostitution. And then there's the later version by the animals, which is about a guy who's a drunk and a gambler. And I thought, well, neither one of those are appropriate for a kid. And so I sort of danced my way around it. I hope I did. Okay. Um, there were times though with various students, not just my Chinese students who would ask me questions where I would have to just say simply, ask your parents, because <laughs> I'm just the guitar teacher. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have a chapter that's uh, 23 things you should never say to a musician. I'm gonna read you some of them. These are my favorites. You had insurance on that guitar, right? Those are not words you ever wanna hear from anybody. How about this one? Sorry, the party was a bust. Go home early, here's half your pay. This happened to my musician father who fronted a four piece band. His response, you don't understand. You don't pay us to play music. You pay us to haul in all this junk and we did that. That's my dad for you. I learned all about business from dad. Here's another one. What's your real job? Killing clueless audience members. <laughs> Can you play a little quieter? I can't hear my friends talk. Could you talk a little quieter? I can't hear my band. Your new album isn't as good as the last one, is it? No, it stinks. That's why I scraped together the $10,000 to record it. All right, this was said by a sound technician after an hour long sound check that really should have taken about 10 minutes, he said. You've just never had good sound before. Right. I wish my acoustic guitar sounded like a 747 taken off at O'Hare all the damn time. Are you the drummer's girlfriend? Wow, that's nice of you to carry his drums in for him. This happened to a friend. Drummers get this stuff all the time. They can't believe a woman can play drums. Here's another one. You can play my bongos anytime. To which the girlfriend replied, sorry, buddy, she's playing mine. <laughs> Are you here with your boyfriend? Sure, he's the one with no one knows I'm a lesbian t-shirt. And my personal favorite, you play pretty good for a girl. Ugh. So again, drive all day because I'm too old to drive all night. That's that's a play on the title of my first book, Drive All Night. 
because a lot of the things that happened to drive all night happened when I was much younger and I really could drive all night. I could drive all day and still do a decent concert at the end of it, but I'm in my sixties now. So driving all night is definitely not an option. Driving all day is kind of risky too. <laughs> so, um, and if you didn't catch it before, you can buy this book at uh, Amazon as well as lots of online retailers like Barnes and Noble. You can buy it at Book Baby. And after we're done here, I'll post some links to places where you can buy it. Hi, Moam. Hope I'm saying that right. Here's a chapter called Visit to Dollywood, May 2015. Bring your own ibuprofen. I had passed the turn off to go to Dollywood many times while on tour, but sadly was never able to go. That all changed when I met my mom and her husband there for the thrill of a lifetime. I know, it seems weird for a feminist folk singer like me to go all gaga over someone who's known for sequined gowns and big hair. However, I've always admired Dolly Parton's strength, intelligence, and positive energy, not to mention that she can sing and write the bejesus out of any song. Really, she's the Beethoven of country music, only she's not deaf. They can both rock a wig, though. There was a 50% chance of rain that day, but armed with umbrellas, we were ready. Short of a level five hurricane, we were going to Dollywood. Probably because of the forecast, there weren't many people there, so we didn't have to wait in line long to catch the shuttle to the gate. We decided to get to the roller coasters before the rain hit. Mom and I loved them. We headed for the mystery mine ride. I'm pretty sure mom was the oldest person in line. She's in her late seventies, but she's not a frail old lady. This was the same woman who parachuted out of an airplane three years prior. We waited while they tested the ride to begin the day. The ride line was long, but the scenery entertaining with everything made up to look like a coal mine, including entertaining signs like no women allowed in the mine unless you can load coal faster than Fred can. I didn't see Fred. Good thing because the ride rattled my brain enough that I wasn't sure I could walk, much less load anything. After downing a couple of ibuprofens, we got in line for another coaster. I couldn't tell you the name. Maybe I needed something stronger than ibuprofen. At any rate, after that, we opted for more sedate rides like the Ferris wheel. The train didn't require any medication either. They have a real steam locomo locomotive that runs around the entire park. We boarded one of the cars. After the three of us slid into one of the bench seats, a woman in a sensible straw hat and just so lipstick pointed to the space beside me and asked if I was saving a seat for my husband. I glanced over at mom who was grinning and waiting to see how I'd respond. LGBTQ people are often put in this kind of situation. We think, do I feel like educating or do I wanna be on vacation? I opted for the latter. She got in with her husband and little granddaughter. Then she asked, where is he? Okay, you asked. She's overseas. Beat one, two. She kept her smile, but something changed in her eyes. Oh, where? Kabul. That's in Afghanistan, right? Yes. Military? No, Red Cross. We chatted another minute before the, rain, the train started up and it was too loud to talk. I enjoyed the ride. As we pulled back into the depot, she turned toward me and said, I'll pray for you and your wife. Some people who aren't Christians take offense at statements like that, but I figure it means she's thinking good thoughts about my partner and that's not a bad thing. Plus, she said wife, even though I never used the, the word. She'd acknowledged our relationship. Maybe the next time she's at a church potluck and someone says something nasty about LGBTQ folks, she'll remember the nice lesbian with the humanitarian wife that she met on a train at Dollywood. There were several areas at the park, each around a theme like Timber Canyon and Owens Farm. We made our way to Craftsman Valley and perused the shops featuring woodworking, glass art, and more, often with crafts people demonstrating what they do. Of course, there was the usual kitsch that you find at amusement parks with everything from sparkly t-shirts to toilet seat covers, all with the Dollywood name or her likeness. I indulged in a ceramic cup. It has, I will, I will always love you in several different languages. Pink, of course. 
That's Dolly's color, I think. Mine too. I like pink. Um, Dolly wasn't at the park that day. Disappointing, but I understood that she's a busy woman. The next best thing was hearing live music, and there was plenty of it. We stopped in a theater to hear a bluegrass country gospel group, and later on the street, we encountered a bluegrass band completely made up of kids under 12 years old. I don't know how the banjo player could even lift his instrument, not to mention playing the crap out of it. We didn't encounter surly employees like I found at other parks. I hope that was because it's a decent working environment. I heard that Dolly's family works there. I was tempted to ask each employee if they were related. I decided to be on good behavior, or maybe that part of my brain was damaged on the mine ride. It's national law that you must eat junk food at an amusement park. At one point, I had a craving for ice cream that was so strong, I would have traded my house for a cone. Fortunately, I didn't have to and found a stand where I bought a cone of soft chocolate ice cream bigger than my head. Toward the entrance on our way out, we found the Dolly Museum. I wished I'd seen it earlier in the day. We only had 20 minutes until it closed, not near enough time to see all of her beautiful gowns, some with matching accessories. I loved seeing her awards, including several Grammys. My absolute favorite, though, was seeing the coat of many colors, the one that inspired her song. Next to it, a handwritten copy of the lyrics, probably done when she first wrote it, judging by the number of crossed out lines. I stood there for the longest time, thinking about the integrity of her music and how she included true stories from her childhood. A lot of country artists pretend they're simple folk from the mountains. Dolly really is. There were video screens everywhere that featured her performances, as well as photos of friends and family. It was clear there was a lot of love in this place. All too soon, it was time to go. It never did rain. Maybe it was those little kids singing, I saw the light, or maybe the clouds were blinded by all those sequins. So that's my trip to Dollywood with my mom and her hus husband. It was really a great time and uh, I would love to go back. And this time I'm gonna stop at the museum first thing so that I can linger at all the displays I wanna stay at and really read all the placards that uh, show there. So um, for those of you who tuned in late, I'm reading from my new book, Drive All Day. And I will be saving a recording of this in case you wanna view the chapters that I read earlier. And I can see your comments as they come in. So if you have any questions or comments about anything that I've read so far or about um, anything that I have put in the book, um, I would be happy to answer them. And if not, I will just uh, keep reading because I really enjoy this. I love writing books, but reading for my books just makes my little performer's heart go pity pat. I mean, that's really different than just writing. You know, writing is done in isolation and that's okay. And I enjoy that too, obviously, or I wouldn't have published three books, but um, reading them is a special joy. And I hope that you're enjoying this now. And don't forget, you know, I can see your comments as they come in and I would be happy to answer your questions about the book. I'd also love to know where you're tuned in from. I am in Ottawa, Canada, and it looks like all of you have tuned in from all over, Massachusetts, Austria, uh, Cambodia. I think there was someone from Arizona earlier. And uh, yeah, Tucson, that's so cool. Um, so let me know where you're tuning in from. I have uh, followers on my YouTube channel from all over the world. And uh, that's one of the things I love about teaching on YouTube is that I can reach so many of you. And the cool thing about videos is that you can view them anytime you want. Um, I do have private students that I teach through Skype, but sometimes figuring out the time difference is a little dicey. I recently had to give up a, um, a private student in Germany because it was like 11 o'clock at night her time and she just couldn't stay awake and oh uh, how hard that must have been <laughs> she waited a long time for lessons too because i've got a waiting list um upper peninsula of michigan oh wow i don't think i've been to the upper peninsula i've been all over michigan i have family in the is it called the lower part of Michigan, Lower Michigan. I don't know what it's called. And um, I spent some time in Michigan uh, in July and August. I played some festivals there. I really like Michigan. 
when I was a kid, I always said I was going to live there in the summer because when you're from Arizona, you kind of dream of a place that's a little cooler in the summer than Arizona. Um, so I have a chapter about my trip to Hawaii. It's called Ukuleles in Hawaii. There were beaches. <laughs> Um, I have several chapters about festivals that I've been to, kind of a review of, you know, what Jamie did at the festival, and I include a, a lot of humor. Um, and I write about my ukulele group that I led for a few years. I really miss them, and it's called Yes, You Can Play. These boots are made for walking on the ukulele. I think I've got time for probably one more chapter. Um, this one is called A Thing of Beauty. Let me get a drink. Oh, Sandra, so you're above the Mackinac Bridge. and Oh, okay. I know where that is. Yeah. I've been to Sault Ste. Marie, so I must have crossed on the Mackinac Bridge. All right. So uh, this is a chapter called A Thing of Beauty. I came to Canada from Southern Arizona by way of North Carolina. I reasoned that since I was able to graduate from the unforgivingly hot desert to a state that actually had snow in the winter, that Ottawa would be an easy adjustment. But alas, too much sun had addled my brain. You didn't want to be around me that first Canadian winter. One particularly grueling day, I drove across town on slushy streets to a doctor's appointment as gobs of wet snow pummeled the car, then came home and shoveled the front walk as tiny needle-sharp snowflakes flew at me. I felt like Sisyphus in a parka. I was already planning how I'd pack all I owned in a couple of suitcases and head back to the land of not real winter when I implored of my wife, how do people live here? After she finished laughing, she gently patted my shoulder, gave me a warm hug, and uttered soothing words. I think she mentioned chocolate and have some. It worked for a few minutes before I started fretting about the next snowfall. It's a wonder my suffering wife didn't divorce me before the end of December. It didn't help that every Canadian I met wanted to tell me what a mild winter it was, or that my family in Arizona taunted me with pictures of backyard barbecues in the beautiful sunshine. My second winter was better. I started to get used to the low temperatures. I learned to walk on ice. Well, walk is a misnomer. Carefully shuffle would be more accurate. I had a new pair of rugged boots with sharp cleats. Still, I stayed inside for two or three days at a time, huddled next to a heating vent, which was easy to do since I taught music lessons at home. Sometimes I'd look over at a student and see a trickle of sweat snaking its way down the side of their face. It could have been from the rigors of bar cords, but it was probably because I had the furnace cranked up to a temperature only known in hell, their hell, my heaven. They learned to wear short sleeves under outdoor winter wear, and I learned to whine less about the winter. For the third winter, I had this crazy notion to walk to my twice weekly yoga class. I didn't make the decision on my own. My robust wife walked 45 minutes to work each morning and assured me that the short walk to yoga was nothing. She's from Northern Ontario where they scoff at anything less than a meter of snow. I should have considered the source, but then I married her and she loves me, I think. Each way to class took 15 minutes, 20 if it was icy and I had to do my Tim Conway old guy shuffle. If you're a fan of Carol Burnett, you might remember his oldest man character who crept along with tiny steps. It's a great way to motor over a slick, cold surface, providing I'm not giggling too much about being Tim Conway. I reasoned that I need some incentive beyond a great yoga class at the end of this frigid journey, so I look for a thing of beauty on each trip. Once, it was the intricate bare tree branches against a luminescent pearl gray sky. Another time, it was sunlight merrily sparkling on newly fallen snow. I noticed a fellow pedestrian's warm smile the gentle tinkle of wind chimes from a front porch, a happy terrier trotting in front of her owner, and the cheery mural of sunflowers on a neighbor's garage door. Each trip, I found something different. 
The temperatures dipped lower and lower as winter lumbered on. I continued to walk. Sometimes I had to add a heavy wool scarf, extra thick socks, or a pair of mittens over my gloves. A couple of mornings, I strapped on cleats so I wouldn't slip on the slick surface. I still fell. One time it was a slow motion backward on a cushion of snow, like something you'd see in a cartoon. Fortunately, it didn't hurt at all. <clears throat> I learned to watch for black ice and just as dangerous, white ice, the kind that forms when snow gets tramped down too many times. Previous to this, the only ice I knew was the kind that came in cubes from our freezer and the ice we had to scrape off our windshields once or twice a year in Arizona. For us, that was winter. Cue tiny violins playing slowly in minor key. Imagine my surprise after moving to Canada when I found ice on the inside of my windshield. My wife claims it's frost. Whatever. It's cold and I have to scrape it off. The only time I fell hard was on a sunny spring day with not even a memory of snow or ice. As a cardinal started a melodic song, I stepped over a low chain and in a split second found myself on all fours on a concrete walkway. The surprise knocked the wind out of me and I could feel a breeze creeping over my right knee and a mild throbbing pain in my right foot. After a long minute, I carefully made my way to standing. All the parts seemed to move, albeit with a little pain. Still, I figured I might as well make the rest of the journey. <clears throat> Humming, I am woman, I limped to yoga class. After an hour of down dog and triangle pose, I inspected my knee and was shocked to find not only a bright green bruise, but blood that had started to stain my yoga pants. My teacher gasped and asked if she could get me a bandage. No, I cheerily replied, I'm fine. After all, I trekked my way through below zero temps all winter. How could this be bad? I slowly treeped home. Two days later, I ended up at hospital because my aching foot wouldn't let me sleep. An x-ray revealed a broken bone. Maybe I should have called this story, dumbass things I have done. <laughs> Note to self, always walk around the damn chain. It only takes five extra seconds. And a thing of beauty shouldn't cause you to abandon caution, even if it's birdsong on a gorgeous May day. And most certainly don't do yoga on a broken foot. Instead of down dog, it'll be falling on the floor dog, which I suppose could offer some benefit like breaking the other foot. Yoga is all about balance. I digress. On one particularly crazy cold morning, I slogged through unplowed streets, the snow sometimes knee high. Wind blew falling snow across the landscape like some crazy blender with no lid. I stopped outside of the door of the yoga studio, brushed the wet snow off my jacket and stomped it off my boots, then gratefully slid into the warmth. After I unwrapped my wet scarf, yanked off my mittens, shrugged out of my heavy coat and pried off my boots, my yoga teacher asked me how the walk had been. Great, I answered, thinking of how pretty the fat snowflakes looked as they swirled around me. She turned toward the other three students, all Canadians, and explained that I'd been walking to class all winter. One of them sputtered, we drove. I'll bet they wanted to say, hell no, we didn't walk. However, eager to prove to the American that Canadians are really polite, they elected not to say that out loud. I should have been given citizenship at that very moment, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that I became a Canadian. I filled out the requisite mounds of paperwork. The government knows more about me than my mother does and pledged my solemn allegiance to the queen. I'm convinced, however, this honor came to me because of those walks in the coldest months and the beauty I found there. Ottawa in winter is full of beautiful things. I've got a long list in case you don't believe me. So that's my chapter, A Thing of Beauty. And um, one more quick chapter. This is called The Last Chapter. My editor said I needed a final chapter to wrap things up. Here it is, the end. <laughs> when my editor first saw that, she said it back to me and she said, very funny. <laughs> well, that's how it goes sometimes. So I really appreciate that you all have tuned in from uh, so many places. Ooh, Istanbul. Oh, that's cool. Well, welcome, Cynthia. And uh, 
Yeah, people from all over. That's so cool. Um, so I've been reading from Drive All Day, which is my newest book, and you can buy it at Amazon as well as a bunch of other online retailers. Uh, some independent bookstores do carry it too if you want to get it at a brick and mortar store. Uh, if you're in Ottawa, you can buy it at uh, The Spaniel's Tale, which is our new uh, indie bookstore which I'm excited about. And uh, please look for my other books. Um, this one's called An Army of Lovers, which is about women's music of the 70s and 80s. And um, also Drive All Night, which is my first book. It's also a memoir. And uh, you can get those first two books at Bella Books and you can buy all three also from Goldenrod Books. So um, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those of you who tune in for my lessons, know that I will continue to post lessons, usually on Thursdays and Saturdays. So keep an eye out for those. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. It really means a lot to me. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.